Shihido, yes, she's a, 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 I brought him over here to do a presentation. We've been having this conversation. So sometimes we, we get together with our families and work together in professional um, places and help teamwork and working and he works for a First Nations clinic in Albuquerque and um, I invited him over here for the psychology program and um, me teaching the uh, NIS 311 class with the traditional healing methods, care and um, preventive care, healing and then also talking about modern technology, modern medicine. And um, he's going to talk about integrative care and, um, and um, so listen up if you're going to have to write something for me, take notes and then um, I'll give you Mr. Sir Lorenzo Jim. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Uh, Good evening, everybody. Oh. I say, mm hmm. Yeah. I say, mm hmm. It's good to be here. Um, well, it's good to be anywhere, right? <laughs> I hope you're not in a rush. I was just doing a cultural safety training to the city of the Regional Health Corporation, their new counseling center. And one of the cultural safety uh, skill was following what they call people time, and not clock time. So we call it a polychronic time versus monochronic time. Where people, uh, <clears throat> we uh, initiate movement. Monochronic time, the clock initiates that for us and it ends it for us too pretty quick. So it's good to be here. So I'm just gonna just provide you a lens of possibilities uh, where you're at. This is a really great step. Um, it's a really important um, and a very complex system that you're studying as well as. Um, really where you come from. So there's already a, a blueprint, I call it an ancestral blueprint, as like um, it's economical, sociological, anthropological, there's all these different systems already in place from millennials being a Diné person, as well as a construct too. There's a government, there's laws, there's all these different cultural constructs that are already in place. <clears throat> so when I see you here, or to see you here, you're, you're really a part of that already. So that's really, uh, really a good like, really cool. <laughs> so the concept of integration, uh, what are the possibilities and I feel like sometimes when I present, or I'm from kind of the outside looking in, but I'm also from the inside looking out. So what does that mean? Um, where I come from in my community, which is actually, um, it's a sacred area, it's a sacred site that now you see where I'm from. There's a place called Kalu Gizi right there too. So our community, where I live too, um, my home, it's uh, part of the traditional, it's part of the cultural and an ancestral place in Albuquerque. So I had to convince myself, because I, thank you, I, I had to convince myself, and I actually learned that later on, because I would hear patients, I would, listen to patients that are in Albuquerque saying, I feel disconnected because I'm away from my home. Or I, just, I feel disconnected because I'm away from the mountains. Or I feel disconnected like I'm not supposed to be here 
because I was told not to. Or I often hear that I feel disconnected because I don't know my language, who, who I am. So I quickly learned that to, you know, sort of learn uh, and appreciate where I was, where I'm from. Where it doesn't matter where I'm at. So with that thought, um, I'm going to make some connections tonight and then actually kind of maybe even um, shift, what do you call it, paradigm shift, hopefully, of what possibilities are um, <clears throat> and to redefine what the net values are, maybe we even redefine what traditional medicine is, traditional healing. And it, it's just a start because I'm just sort of exploring right now, kind of like a, a uh, uh, making collaborations and sort of step, taking those steps of integration and then eventually towards adaptation and, and all that good stuff. Uh, this is where I was raised, a place called Izazpas. So these are, uh, um, they're friends and colleagues from different places, I think, from um, Nigeria, Scotland, uh, from Cuba, from Maine, um, and they really like mutton. So here's a traditional idea, and part of that that paradigm shift maybe can begin with this thought. And it was an indigenous person actually from uh, she's a social worker from Egypt. <clears throat> so sometimes the same hardship you wish would be removed is the very thing that is curing, protecting, and saving you. How I many you kind of catch that? You have to kind of think about it a little bit. Um, I have uh, two BA students in the Dine Studies, and we're, we're talking about and we're discussing social issues as opposed to this. Not opposed, but supporting this. Mm -hmm. And so our question as we sit here is supposed to be the fact that um, how do they deal with elders? What is elder care? What is patient care? How, what is the idea? What are they saying outside? I mean, you put them on a helicopter, you put them in an airplane. Some of them, they don't like to be up in the air and they have this idea that this is not my place. How do you I mean, I guess that's what you're going to, I mean, this is a very interesting provocative thought. Yes. So, this, this is a um, really interesting picture of an actual, like an intervention, but being a patient versus being a, looking at this person, a young girl, probably about five years old, even as young as she is in her journey, she's being recognized kind of as a healer herself. So what do we call like a, from a victim to a survivor? If you see, if you look, you can see Kind of like white spots on her body. So she overcame like adversity, hardship. Um, she became sort of a recognized, I guess, person that had the ability, the gift to adapt, I guess, overcome. And uh, we don't know, I guess, that we say, um, there's a process that we're going to learn in a little bit to call it nadir experience. Conflict, transition, and growth. But um, this is a, a really good step because actually earlier somebody had told me like this is like if we hadn't struggled, I don't know if this is going to make any sense, but if we hadn't been incarcerated and if we didn't sign the treaty, we wouldn't have this land. We wouldn't be protected from the government that created that. So you have this government to government agreement saying now we are protected. If 
that didn't happen. So even through that hardship, we get there's something else that formed, or you could say was something that was manifested through that. And then I think everyone here understands some form of like trauma, for example. So as you grow, there's sort of this transition that is created. Um, and we're and we're gonna kind of walk into that here in a little bit, what that transition is. I'm gonna share some different models comparative, they call comparative analysis. But first I'd like to dissect the word traditional, because I seen that a lady with a tattoo on her neck that said traditional. This is supposed to be funny. That word traditional is even like an identity now. Is even like traditional means it's like even like a, a social kind of like a um, place, a sociological place. But let me take a step back. When we say traditional means like time honored um, it's established, in other words, it's proven, a custom, it's normal, it's a standard, it's the way it works. I'll give you an example, I don't know if anybody likes to fish here. So you have this um, fishing line, and then you have this fishing hook. So something that was passed down, like a, a traditional way to tie it. And when I tie it that way, it's proven to work. So let's put, let's put another thought into it, like a Western eye, like a new idea, a new thought. So what that means is I still have the same hook and the same line, but there's another way to tie it, a new technique. So when we say traditional, it's fixed, it's proven, it's old as our language as old as the land. So a, um, it's, it's um, I would like to say, um, a foundational, I guess you could say a platform. It's also ancestral, it's handed down. Every word, every um, part of the culture, so I like to call that like the living culture, kind of like how communities live, how families live, how you function as an individual. So that's another definition of traditional. How many of you have a traditional um, dress, traditional shoes? How many of you have a traditional um, menu at home? Spam and potatoes is not traditional. <laughs> How many of you have a traditional language that you speak? That wasn't, it's sort of, or how many of you understand a traditional language? Right? Or it's, it's old. It's uh, what we call practice-based evidence. <laughs> Here's traditional wellness, and I'm going to talk about wellness, and I think I might talk a little bit about clinical, so clinical, um, what we call like um, diagnostical clinical perspective versus uh, how we look at wellness because this was, and I'm going to talk a little bit about a behavior chain as well, because in psychology, there's different, it's many, many different um, roots. Some people will say, when you hear someone that says the mind, right away it tells you what area of psychology that they're talking about. And then somebody can say your thought. That's a whole other area. And then somebody's gonna say behavior. It's a whole other area. But my focus is going to be on the brain, which is a whole other area of psychology. Is that okay? You guys catch my drift a little bit? 
it's going to get better. It's going to it's going to blow your mind. So wellness is the result of personal initiative, taking responsibility, and making positive choices. So we all have work to do every day. So creating these steps will ensure a better quality of life, not only for ourselves, but for others. So I'm going to use this word, and this is really important. It's called reinforcement. So we need to integrate the net values. There's a lot of reinforcements. I'm going to use this clinical word. How many heard of this word called mindfulness? How many of you saw it, maybe, or seen it somewhere, or heard about it somewhere, like in a hospital, or a behavioral health setting? Practice mindfulness. What about um, self-talk? How many heard that somewhere? It's a clinical word now. Self-talk. So <clears throat> this is just a, one example. So you would have you would get up. How many of you have heard this? Maybe they teach this still, or maybe you're maybe you're practicing this. How many of you heard like get up early in the morning and check your cell phones? <laughs> Make sure your phone is charged. I had a nephew who was asleep. He said, I don't want to get up, Mom. He says, hold on. He's like, no, my, I'm not charged yet. He said, that give me about five more minutes. And he sleep. <clears throat> he got him. He wanted to see his hands. Oh, Mom, I'm all charged up now. I get up. But this is part of that reinforcement. They would stand there. My grandma would do this. She's the only one that I see in practice this in. Maybe every every other Saturday morning or Sunday morning I see this. But my grandma would do it when I'd stay with her every day. And she wouldn't say one word about it. But she'd just walk away like that in the morning I could hear the door. And she'd be standing way over there. She had cornmeal. And she would say, like, everything is going to be all right. I'm going to be strong today. Help my family take care of them. And then she'd come back around and come back in the home. So what she did, what that value, that practice is, is called self-talk. You catch that? Because what, she, what did she just say to herself? I'm going to be strong. What else? Everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay. So reassurance, positive reinforcement. And then what is she doing? Mindfulness, right? She's practicing that. So I call, we call um, cornmeal like a positive reinforcement tool. And I was sharing this one time to a group of kids who are incarcerated with CYD, which is the Children, Youth, and Family Department, Juvenile Justice, and they got it. And they were like, Mr. Jim, we don't have any cornmeal. All we have is corn nuts from commissary. Can we use that? I said, yeah, of course. Because you're initiating mindfulness, right? And that's, that's important. Something to think about. So. When we talk about our treatment modality, we can get as complex or complicated into our, I call it our DNET medical, our DNET clinical systems of care. It's my dad here, he's, take as much as you can from Avery, you know, from our different practitioners that we have, our specialists, because they understand sort of a whole different, when we talk about clinical, the net clinical. But this is another treatment modality, and this is something that I'll share more about as we're um, working today to integrate, integrate, 
care. And when we say like um, right, helping, how many know um, the word no uh, hoka vegan dinner? Have you ever heard that? The net, right? No hoka vegan dinner. So like the earth surface sacred being. And I, I realized there's like hakakit. The yin the na means like the fish under the water. The is caught the na the yin. There's people, beings like the deer. So there's so many different beings that are in coexistence. They say, including us people. So there's you usually well used well today is different, but let's say. Yesterday, you would only hear four domains of what a person sort of might look like, or what a human being, defining what it means. One is usually physical, mental, emotional, and usually spiritual, right? But there's so many dimensions. Even financial is now part of being human. We have to have financial, right, stability, I even went to ceremonies where somebody just prays for money today, right? Because it's a part, it's an important domain. So it is constantly evolving as, as, we're, as, we, as we're evolving. So many multiple dimensions of wellness, um, many different things to balance, in other words, many different things to understand many different things to educate yourself with and to gain knowledge or skills and abilities in order to keep that balance. So let me jump right into this. Oh yeah, I won't give you a prescription on how to integrate certain specific things. This is just really Things because I want to come back to the college and share it, so I'll, I'll take another step. As we'll kind of like open up you know, different discussions and maybe bring you guys over to First Nations. But what is integration? Let's start from there. What is integration? It's a big college word. So you guys should know. Okay. What's integration? Is it like co collaboration? Collaboration. Yeah. Together. So you're incorporating, right? Yeah. Bring in something. One more? Anyone else want to? Anybody? What is integration? Adding on to. Adding on to. Here's some other definitions. So combining, unifying, uh, connecting, incorporating, and blending together. So integration. It's really like a, a puzzle. So you're creating something that you know you're sort of figuring it out. But you know, you're thinking the pieces might fit or might not fit. It's never, ever, never, ever um, decisive. And it's really okay because everybody is when everything is isn't met. Even like what they say, water and air, they're very different particles, right? Even fire and water, can you integrate those together? Maybe, uh, <clears throat> or when we start blending thoughts, people. So integration can be very complicated. I'm going to make it really simple for us. How many remember this? <laughs> How many of you ever used one of those? Can you ask me that? <laughs> what is it? How many of you were born in, in the 1900s? 
<laughs> you would know. It used to be a quarter, wasn't it? And then it went up all of a sudden. It was like What's a dime? dime. <laughs> it was a dime. That was a million back. Well, this is traditional. That's how old I am. This is what our elders used. There used to be one before that, too. It was like a rotary, remember? Yeah. <laughs> so it evolved. It changed, right? Into, how many have one of those? How many have a smartphone? Maybe How many have a, is it iPhone 11? Ernie had an iPhone 1. Ernie so see you. I had a, it was really, it was old. You call it, this is my iPhone 1. <laughs> <coughs> so, we don't know, we, I guess in, in, in time, as things evolve, when we start to blend, when we start to collaborate, when we start to infuse, when we start to adapt, then you will see it. But even as we're sharing right now, there's, there's integration happening. So we didn't know this was ever going to come out. It sort of evolved. And it's even getting more complicated. And it's getting more convenient. So we're integrating. So how many ever use Uber Eats? How many know what Uber Eats is? Do they have it here at <laughs> Somebody from the gas station brings you a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> you pay for it. Well, that's a very complex form of integration. It's capturing, it's making many different connections, and it's very convenient. I have a niece that goes to NAU, and I heard that there's a robot that can deliver your food. You order, and then with this thing, is like a box. You can see it going around campus. And somehow it's a GPS, it knows where to go. And then where you're at, it comes to you. And then there's a code that detects you, and then you put it in, and it opens it. And you get your your uh, your food. <laughs> and then if you're trying to be all sneaky and mighty and try to take it, and that thing starts screaming and tells you to put me down, put me down, <laughs> making a lot of noise. But do you see this infusion, this integration, as we, as things are evolving and I think even um, in education, everything begins like we're talking about theories, and then you start putting into practice, and then you start to evolve in that. You make it even. You're, there's so much, you know, we call it syncretism. Many things, are, thoughts are emerging, or merging. Anything's possible. If Taco Bell's and Pizza Hut integrate, right? How many of you order breadsticks and a burrito? Is that, is this integrated? Like, who knew that would happen, right? So do you guys catch my drift of integrated over integration? So here's something called cultural value reinforcement. So this is the only slide where you'll see a bunch of words. So it's the reinforcement of positive cultural knowledge or strength-based cultural knowledge, skills, and abilities. KSA believes practices, behaviors, and systems, not religion. Even a complex form of spirituality. Um, I know elders who were like uh, botanists, elders who were uh, mediators, you know, elders who, man, they were, you know, 
there were ecologists, agriculturalists, who understood the very, they were very well versed in their field. So that's not religion. So every aspect of culture, knowledge, skills, and abilities. So using specific approaches, focusing, they focus on creating positive change toward the person's social, emotional, mental, physical, spiritual, financial, educational, all those different domains. So kind of like where we're at right now today, um, who we are versus, I guess, even our culture can teach us something new again something different. So there's a word in here, um, it's called change. Change is an awful word in any clinical or any, any health system. Change is really hard. Let's see if we can try this, let's capture. I want you to hold on to how you've you know, what you experience here in a little bit. And then tell me, then let's, we, let's define what change is. Everybody go ahead and see your hand. Let's try this. We go around. Let's try this. All right. Now put your hands together. And put it real good. Look at it. Okay. Now open it up. We go around. Now close it, but put the other thumb on top. How did that feel? Emotionally, how did that feel? Uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. Strange, awkward. Strange, awkward. Yeah. Different. Anybody have anxiety? <laughs> <laughs> A little bit. You almost have to rethink it up. Throws you off. Physically, too, how many you feel in your body? You almost have to like recenter or push it almost. That's what changes. So when we talk about cultural values reinforcement, it's taking us back to that place of optimal health, I guess, right? Yeah, like. Okay, so basically it's a correlation of indigenous positive health values which are aligned and delivered with common Western or mainstream approaches. So this alignment or secretism focuses toward addressing challenges and to facilitate the positive outcomes. And we'll talk about different things. I'm barely getting my foot in the door in different systems. One of them is um, as a, at the hospital, the University of New Mexico Hospital, <coughs> I think I have like five badges. Sometimes I just wear them all just to, you know, like, I don't know, the badge of honor, I guess. <laughs> Walking around the house with the badges. But I go to the University of New Mexico Hospital as the, it's called a, we created this um, position called Native American Cultural Care Chaplain. So that's my title. So if we put us in a line, my colleagues, so you would have this Methodist director, you have this Catholic priest, and you would have this you know, Mormon, and you would have all the way down the line, then you have this Navajo, and that, this cultural care provider. I was just thinking about when I was going down this road between coming up this way. I saw this family, they got into a bad car accident right here on that highway. And I just reflected on that. It came out. You know, the air lifted. They took them to University of New Mexico Hospital, which is a trauma one um, care center. And she had nobody to come see her. There's anyone, that was my first impression on when I saw, walked into the room and the, the baby, the daughter was, she was in a coma. She was coming in and out of it, but I don't know, there's something purple that they put in her mouth. 
I don't know what it was for. He was to, you know, they could drink or he's been, is it like a dye? It goes into the bloodstream. And um, just making this connection, this we call it comfort care, was, um, was an important step. And being at the hospital, I would, it would be really foreign, like you said, an elder. This would be, you know, non-natives, um, totally different environment. Things moving around, lights, you know, oxygen in the room, sort of like confined, and everything's <clears throat> chaotic. You've lost a loved one, or you're in pain, you're suffering, you're sick. You're very vulnerable. You're, they're not even wearing underwear. They're wearing this gown. And um, I remember the first time I had this discovery as I was standing at the bedside. And as I was reinforcing this, I said, oh, this, uh, see, first, you're a patient. She had a, uh, I was looking at her wristband and her name. So this is like your identity now, like a Kishnadia. Your remember that little girl that had the marks. She's gonna become a survivor. Now Oshin just nine days. That's our Navajo systems of care is like an inpatient treatment facility for nine days. So she also thought of it. Now you're just gonna sit here and let that bless you. Now I say you can have thought of it. There's a um, IV bag. This is from the mountain, this is from those beautiful places, and it's, -giving, it's giving you life, it's cleaning you. And then are those EKGs, or they call them those things that go up and down? And then the one that goes flat like this? There's all different colors. As a dish, you can eat nipfish. Eating it, don't is eating it, shut so eating it, shut guys like all these different lightning. It's it's bringing you power again. So we transform this environment now into a sacred place. You understand? And it's powerful. It's empowering. And it makes the quality of care for. And I've just gotten feedback from providers, nurses, and doctors. Because it seems like it's, it helps in many ways. So, integrated care, so the need for treatment and support for family and community is needed. Meeting people where they're at, what our strengths are, <clears throat> what our systems are, what being, or helping, um, or providing care for. Providing needed wellness tools and skills. Is important. Facilitating the process of our steps towards positive changes. There's this big thing now, and you hear this, it's now like a buzzword. <clears throat> and it's something called um, trauma informed care. And you'll hear that, you know, if you're the more you go into like mental health, you, you'll hear this modality. There's another thing called EMDR. Have you ever heard of EMDR? Anybody tell us what that is? It's a way to treat trauma using back and forth work. It, it works on all levels, and it helps both sides of the brain communicate. It's like physiological and it helps healing. 
the desensitizing, reprocessing, right? The bilateral stimulation, back and, back and forth, tapping. tapping. So they have these things they call tap tiles. So I'm going to put a glasses on you, and then this light goes back and forth. And you would basically share your trauma, and you wouldn't know it, but your brain is desensitizing just by this bilateral stimulation. But sometimes you hold this tactile, it's like two, it's like a wand, and it vibrates this way, this way, this way. And while you're talking, you're stimulating your, your, what they, remember, um, so, everybody say, say shita. Shita. Everybody just do it for it. Shita. So shita begin, right? So hata ki ekwe so your executive brain, your processing brain is right here, your, we call it your frontal lobe. That's everything about, I think, in, like there's a reason why you, you go to college later on, you don't go to college when you're five years old. Some people might, but because you're able to understand you're able to process information and synthesize and construct thoughts and all that here. Back here, sorry, uh, your down, down edge there, kind of like right here, is your limbic brain. That's like your primitive brain. All emotions, fight or flight. So when you're basically doing this bilateral stimulation, you're bringing this brain and this brain together. That's what that means. So the net values, we already do bilateral stimulation. So when a medicine person tells you to stand up, what, what, at a, what foot do you have to walk first? Step off with first. Your right foot. When you get a kick, a chain done, what foot you have to step with first? Usually your right foot, right? So when you walk in, you have to think about throughout the night, you know, this bilateral stimulation. Have you heard that before? Everything sort of works together. So even when you hold like the ceremonial, our tactiles, ajoya. I don't So we're constantly doing that processing all night. So and then by the time in the morning it says, Oh you're okay. You kind of feel better. So it's kinda of like that integration is needed. Um, it's another part of I guess the another integration idea. Here's a key point, referential talk or sharing session. So it refers to the disclosure and sharing of a personal story in the process of correlating the reflective experience to that of a culturally significant, significant construct or hero story. We call them um, archetypes. So let's think about this um, Nike. Do you know what Nike is? We had pro wings back then. So Nike, uh, what's the slogan for Nike? Just do it. That's what it's called. Just do it. What about, what's the slogan for Chrysler? What does Chrysler represent? Kind of like elegance, right? What's the... Um, What does Jeep represent? That what is your slogan for Jeep? Let's get out there. Let's get out there. So there's, in other words, like an archetype, one of our many different complex personalities, emotions, is sort of like a threshold and it opens us up. 
So when you're needing or lacking or needing courage in our culture, right away, right, we go towards like the twin warriors to sort of initiate and sort of um, reinforce or to engage. And then when they tell you to soothe, right, calm down, um, and it's going to be, or to nourish yourself, take care of yourself, and be changing woman. So we call these archetypes. And that's a basic understanding of what we call referential talk. So when you hear someone tell their story, right away you can connect them as a provider, I guess, you know what I mean? You kind of, that's your, you initiate that. It's a key point. And I, I wish I could spend more time on the actual like certification of the cultural value reinforcement approach and how to, it's a practice, it's not a theoretical model but I, maybe that's another time. <coughs> so here's the process of um, what we call a cultural care process. And then, like this is even integrated care language. But it, you know, people say ceremony, nahala. But it's kind of, I guess in a way where um, my colleagues would understand is a, call it cultural curative process. So usually conflict, so it's kind of a process this way. Conflict, so in Shkajo, right? On the left, remember that? The, the bilateral stimulation, so from in Shkajo, they are look in Shkajo. What does, uh, how would you translate, I know it means left hand, but how would you translate in Shkajo? The difficult side, right? That you're not used to the challenging side in Chicago. So it's the ye chico. And then in in shna chico sha. Are you visioning the Nigiya, what you're used to, what's comfortable? So tra that transition, we say like maladaptive and issues and symptoms. You can use this as a diagnostic tool as well. So you always focus, usually the focus is on past self disclosures, problem focus the trauma. So this is what, in quote, like, I'm depressed, I'm sad, I'm confused, I'm lost. And then we always say, like, the enemy we right? Kind of like, what, what um, we would say represents this place. It's, it's, it's really difficult when you're hurting, when you're in pain, when you're lost, anybody, for anybody, but yet it's hard, hardship. So there's this transition. So the ceremonial, the cultural value reinforcement approach intervention, and then there's an engagement that happens. There's a language, there's this reinforcement, there's comfort, care, connection, safety. So my dad, Avery, he's one of our cultural care specialists at First Nations. So we, we work, we get referrals from everywhere in our collaboration, in our network, from district drug courts all the way to our psychiatry program. And then what we do is we line them up. We kind of like triage because this is the a, a important intervention. And I think we have enough data to really see that where that transition happens when there's comfort, care, connections, 
even the frequency, the sound, a song, words, when they're reflected back to them. And it's more solution focus. The kaga has to take place, they say, right? There's a way out of it. So that release reinforcement. Maybe it's one type of intervention. Maybe other kinds of interventions, like your family might intervene. Something is going to intervene. And then there's that next step, or next in Shnajo is that growth stage. Care, life skills, therapy, and the rebuilding phase. So you always hear that this place here, that's where the personal leadership, you're practicing these different life skills. There's more focus. So, we, so you always hear that I have more energy. And these are actually quotes from patients. I have more energy. I'm happy. I'm confident. I found myself. That's like the beauty way of this. And this is um, one of the um, the process that we use, I guess, you could use this as a as a treatment plan too, a care plan. Nurse practitioners, nurse, everybody knows they're here when they come to the hospital or a treatment center. So without it, yeah. there's a process that's created. So the approach again, conflict, transition, and growth, which is really every day. And when you look at it like that, like there's challenges and then there's always going to be something that, that you learn. I'm going to share this, uh, the, uh, our, I love our, I love our psychology, I love our disciplines and knowledge and skills and abilities. I learned this, um, There's a um, archetype called Boston Ishki, the obsidian boy. It's planting season. The earthly planting season is finishing up uh, for us, would we, us, our own character our own life way, I guess. But then you'll start seeing these black clouds. Big little Hardships coming. We say, Bashan Ishki. It's planting, it's called spiritual planting. Ceremonial planting. In other words, you're going to put something in your life to challenge you. So you go through the season, and then springtime, you kind of like evolve to kind of mature, I guess. They say. So it's a kind of like the same process that you'll find even in nature, like from winter, spring, summer, through fall. So the building blocks so traditional medicine follows the same con or the same archetypes. So man is a conscious being developed from a primitive unconscious state identical to the organic process of life. So a life of seasons, for example, um, you might be in a new relationship, a new job, a new class, so you're like in a season of spring. And then you're going to be in a season of summer where everything, you're active and everything is happening, it's fun, your life of summer. And then you're going to be in a life of fall where everything is in abundance, everything you work for, your relationships, 
grown, and then you're going to be in a life of winter, season of winter, where everything's a struggle, everything's cold. And then we, you transition out of that again, right? And I think as the now we sort of always look at this process sort of more organic. We, my uncle called that like geocentric thinking, right? always move around with the sun, right? So everything begins that way when you get a like a ceremony, a thought when the like I shall be careful. And they tell you to go step outside and they tell you to turn around and look around. And then from there every morning you do that. Pretty soon from there you evolve, you start to think. Um, you're moving with sort of like that organic process. So they call it the nadir experience, collective consciousness. I like to call, I, like, I usually share a lot <clears throat> on adapting our cultural values toward modern changes and challenges. Just a show and tell. This is where I was raised. So I didn't need a program, I didn't need any money to do this, but I, my son and daughter and, and then my nieces, nephews, and friends, we would hike to the, anywhere in this, in the mountain, we would take everything, food, water that we could carry, and I told them, I told them, don't bring any tents. So then we'd sit around, and we'd do priorities of work, we'd call it, security and all that, and we'd sit down, and we'd eat, they, it's something that transforms people, like when you just go into nature. And that's where I really connected with my son, too. And I noticed something. There was about five different berries. Not just not just chichen. And I noticed all the different things in our environment that you know, is there. But... Um, Something different, I guess. And here's a, we call this a cultural iceberg model. So Dr. Uh, Edward T. Hall, Dr. Jack Pondin, a good friend of ours, they study different cultures in Hopi, uh, the Maasai people in Africa. And what they found that there was different depths and levels to what you call culture. So the top, like explicit culture, and then the bottom, we call it implicit culture. So the common or surface level, those assumptions, you know, like um, Navajos love to eat sheep. Navajos smell like sheep. All Navajos are good looking, those assumptions, right? What we think we know. And even that, but our own, today, our culture, what they think we are. But it, who they are. But as you go into the deeper, the unknown, or the, what you can't see, what's not there, the language, social norms of our culture community, and way deep, the family, cultural beliefs, values, the sacred. So when I emerge or immerse, or when I went into nature, I learned a little bit more about values. You know, when you're scared at night, and then you have to rely on yourself, you have to work together. Um, the thought. You should, maybe, you can, I've never seen an iceberg. Anybody ever seen one? Do you have one around here? So you can probably change this and put a tree or a corn, corn stalk. So the basic behavior chain thing. So every program, behavioral health, cognitive behavioral therapy, they always look at this as sort of the human equation. So our beliefs and thoughts influence your feelings, your feelings 
influence your action, their behaviors, your action behaviors create the consequences and outcomes. So Prochaska, De Clemente, stages of change. So they use this also as an assessment tool. To kind of, they say, meet people where they're at. Somebody might be in an action stage, you know, in their recovery or sobriety. So many might not even really think that they have a problem, so they're at the contemplation in the very beginning stages. So as the net integrating the net values, we have this very similar building blocks from the beginning, emergence, the directions. It's kind of backwards, but you guys use that like up here? That's perfect. So let's just use this model, a uh, Western model. So this is the East, right? Insahakes. What is the first one? Our beliefs and thoughts. What is the second one? Feelings, right? Preparation, planning, and then what is the fourth one? Enough action, and then the north consequences, outcome. It's the same. It's just it's the um, a correlation. I said you guys stole it from Navajo. <laughs> It's a new thought to an old idea. Ask Avery, where does the song come from? Tell us where this, what the song is about. Home song. The first song? Yeah. And what's the second song? Oh, Yajiki. Oh, Yajiki. Talk about it. Niya, Niya, Niya. And then, that's what I was seeing that. Complete it. You see a correlation? And behavioral health uses. Here's a comparative analysis. So the reinforcement of cultural values. So it kind of goes this way again. The modern disparities and challenges, trauma, trees, addictions, lack of family, our life resources, discord, disconnection with family, community, and culture, medical issues. And then you have these modern, common prevention and treatment practices, Western. So they call trauma-informed care, cognitive behavioral therapy, Alcoholics Anonymous, medication-assisted therapy, preventive health care. My, my area is all in like behavioral health. I've, I've been licensed in New Mexico as a clinician since 2005. <clears throat> and I'm barely understanding primary care. And then, and then Remember the many dimensions to health, we call it um, social determinants of health. So these are, you'll notice there's a lot of focus on mental health, behavioral health. And then the Native American cultural health and wellness values, theoretical, philosophical, as well as practice. So, that concept, so Z, the concept of strength, critical analysis of self-change, you mentioned. The mountains, so critical analysis, reflection, you know, reinforcement. Um, F, the value of healthy relationships, sort of starting from in and out. And it's like the Shema, Shema'i, Shema'i, Shita'i, 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 so there's this traditional story about using how F was restored first starting with ourselves. 
called the towering house story, Kia Anish, key story. So eh, even starting outwards, nature all the way around him is a relationship, coexistence, interdependence, you call it. All we just heard was self-assertivism, self-assertive communication, assertive thinking, um, and then, of course, the ceremonial curative models. Our Navajo to the next ceremonial medical systems of care is very complex. And then, of course, the anticipated outcomes, stabilization, therapy, strong coping and life skills, positive regard for self and others, more awareness and acceptance to care provided, recovery, <clears throat> growth. So it, there's an enhancement when we work with our patients, when we integrate the net values. Even in our little clinic, our Urban American Indian Health Center, we're a Title V clinic. So you have like one in Phoenix, and one in Los Angeles, one in Detroit, and one in Albuquerque, the contractor under Indian Health Services. But we really are able to enhance positive outcomes. Here's, I have to put the picture in the baby. And then uh, these are Department of uh, the State Department got these physicians from, I think it was 18 different countries in Africa. Indigenous people. Oh, they love cornmeal because they were raised on it too. Here I thought blue corn must was only Navajo. And we invented, invented it. But they love it. They said, oh, we eat this every day. But um, these are values. So this is like your care plan right here. And the things that we do now that I see programs and different even treatment programs that when we bring in the next Navajo values groups, uh, like an example is uh, basket weaving. Basket weaving. So it's not just making a basket. So everything that we used to do had a purpose with the moment you woke up. So let me give you an example of uh, um, hunting, hunting. So what values are reinforced for a person, a hunter? What values are reinforced here? Um, All of them, right? Care, why you take care of it. The relationship. Is it easy to get a deer? Um, long ago, you think it was really easy? We call it fast food. <laughs> Personal, all these are reinforced just in that practice. What about cooking? Preparing food, what values are reinforced? All of them. So when we see programs, they say, oh, we're going to do eating or weaving. I said, they're actually reinforcements of these values. So it's reflection when you're doing that. Um, and this is something that you can use as what we call a care plan. So what will change look like for all of us with our cell phones out? I like Avery's uh, uh, ceremonial app. I want to do something called teleculture. Let me tell him that about it. So I'll link you up from here in the college. And then I'm at our clinic, and we can share to students, or maybe we can share to our patients and engage them through telehealth technology. It's a new idea called teleculture.
call it tele-wellness too. So I have said there's a, I talked to this like, uh, Mr. Canal, he's a, a, a behavioral health therapist down at Fight Now Apache Coach Foundation. So I think we're going to integrate at some point. Okay. So here are some basic practices that we are doing. So the Center for Disease Control just funded us for another three years. So remember those values reinforcement? And remember when we say reinforcement, right? Positive change. So we work with students with the National, with the National EU Council. This summer we took them out to like all over, like nine places I think, um, into nature. <clears throat> I really like um, when I went, one of my other badges I have is a, at the Juvenile Justice Center. So they call me a cultural care provider too. And these are, it's a state facility, so this is like, they're adjudicated youth, they're committed, over they're 21 they're violent felonies. And uh, one of the therapists there was telling me, oh, you're gonna have to make everything real short, talk about things because these kids have ADHD, ADD, ODD, and all these acronyms. They're, gonna be, they're not gonna sit still, is it? So it's something real interesting as a method, as a group methodology, was using touch shit. So for two hours, they would sit there. It would be dark, first of all. So there's no distraction, just, what's in your thoughts and you know right here and after a while I realized that all those tarps not much blankets and tarp so if you were to pick up that tarp and move it to the side like this you would see these doing that I call reflection or introspect sitting there for two hours that's a group methodology it's actually a personal leadership skill too. It's called sitting still with yourself and initiating mindfulness. Those are PL skills. Very powerful place there, like sweat lodge. And as I'll see, <laughs> and we integrated horse medicine too, using um, using. Uh, like leadership isn't forced, relationships aren't forced. Complementary, complementary relationship building is beautiful. Even going in with and being a initiate, igniting sort of that awareness, like what you're hearing, what you're thinking. So we transport our patients and different. Um, well, from our clinic out here to Rio Rancho, uh, horse medicine, we initiated, we initiated a call food <coughs> medicine, um, <coughs> nature fitness, of all these different groups that we, the net values that we integrated into our healthcare system. Does this seem fun? And that's something that you can do, because you're, most of you, Probably this is your foundation, right? So you're, you're aware of this. You know it's really effective. Care language. I was going to talk a little bit about motivational interviewing and then how we, this is the format that that Avery uses for patients. But this is they don't include this motivation or interview is just usually those four but it's uh, another evidence-based practice uh, communication kind of umbrella they use a lot in hospitals patient-centered care language so here's some patient feedbacks that we're seeing using integrating the net values into our modern care system realizing i'm equal with nature 
always remembering why I matter. I love the atmosphere here to create positive connections in all the things that I do. It gives me a sense of well-being of who I am as a person and a Native American. Provide me clarification and validation of my work. And this is some of the patients that I've seen Native American. <coughs> is unique in its common sense approach, which enables one to ground themselves. Inside and out, I feel better. And then I really need it to be balanced, and I gain that here. Here are some of my key partnerships. I'm the tribal liaison to metropolitan uh, drug courts, as well as the tribal liaison for the judicial district drug court. I think I had Avery come out one time to one of our um, courts, uh, Billings Wellness Court. They had like the district attorney, public defender, the judge. And then I'm in the courtroom. I think one of them was leaving the judge in Corn Pollen. But um, the courts, uh, so Veterans Court, Billings Wellness Court, Covered Court, so like it's so important to them now. And this, this is part of that integrated care. In lieu of treatment, in lieu of certain groups, they can come over to the traditional wellness program. And that's really saying a lot. Um, the Center for Disease Control Prevention, in, uh, National Indian Youth Council, Presbyterian Health Plan. So the partnership is actually a lot bigger. We're teaching now a, a fourth period class at Cesar Chavez Community School. Um, now, we call it um, a leadership learning experience class, LLP. So, oh, this is like the first step. And uh, I'm working on creating some opportunities, maybe. Um, I have a, we call it a concept ready presentation on Friday and how we could um, provide a certification. Um, it's an idea, but I'm presenting it to one of our managed care organizations in New Mexico. And I think that will kind of create opportunities for you to be able to become certified and to be able to work and integrate different uh, the net values, you know, kind of like what we call it, life lived experiences as a value, and then adding on additional trainings. Because there, there's only clinical certifications, and sometimes you have to go up to like a master's degree to get it. But I'm working on, I think that's going to be um, something that as we evolve and I'll stay connected to Avery, we can talk more about that in possibilities. It's a certification <coughs> program, cultural care specialist. So, is that clear as mud? So we integrate, we've integrated different um, providers, coaching, Pueblos, um, we have Lakota, Dakota, and they don't have to, they can integrate those values. When we talked about, like, remember the list? So most of them are all trained on using all that and this. But the methodologies, though, they can become very complex. And as well as, like, uh, Patrick uses sort of the same models. He created some things that are different, like that work for him. Instead of the starting from here, he uses, like, a different model. It actually starts from the north. But it has sort of those similarities and correlations. Um, he uses a corn stalk, too. <coughs> So a part of my, my work is supervision, too. So we have different providers, Shinoba, Jensen, um, J. 
Jared Lee, Patrick Trujillo, Linda Anderson, Valencia Zoff, um, Robin Renville. So we have different providers, but it's kind of like a, there's a lot of uh, correlations. Really, there's a lot of possibilities when we talk, because I get some ideas from you know the different types. But it seems like this is sort of the format or the uh, you know, like the uh, the place that we meet. I don't know if that makes sense. And then us, we have more of a comp. Uh, with Avery, we have more of a really a, a culturally like an implicit form of intervention. And some of the tribes are very guarded with theirs. It's only provided there at the pueblo. So part of their cultural um, training is culture. We call it cultural safety, yeah. cultural safety. diversity, or cultural competency training that they have to do. And really, it is meeting people where they're at. Because everyone sort of is in a different place, and we kind of we just um, are able to provide you know, what we need for people, um, and then sort of build on that. Any, uh, what are your thoughts, and what are your questions? What are some of your ideas? Why First Nation? Why, why did you name it First Nation Mental Health Center? It's actually part of the Indian Health Services umbrella. So it was created way before me in 1972. So they, it was only providing services only to Native Americans. But today it's evolved. We're a small, what do you call it, um, FQHC. Fairly qualified healthcare center, so we, we're Medicaid providers, so we see basically anybody and everybody. I know First Nations, when I say that, they're like, you're in Canada? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Never been to Canada. I really uh, like how you integrated the, uh, these Navajo um, models and, and ideas and structures into, the, into your health plan. Um, have you ever had seen anyone else do it from like from their own other tribe like Tewa or these other different tribes or something that's more pan Indian? So there, something that can be utilized wherever, wherever they, are, they might find themselves in the country? Yeah, there really is. In behavioral health, there's some models that started in the 80s and 90s, like white bison, the Wabriti, what we call red root, and then Gona gathering of Native Americans. But I noticed, uh, like, two weeks ago, uh, we had a Center for Disease Control conference. So they call it <coughs> Tribal Practices uh, Wellness in Indian Country. And I got to see everybody in the same room share ideas. And everyone, you could see their strengths, and you could see sort of, you know, like, like a puzzle the group from Seattle Indian Health Board, Portland Indian Health Board, the South Central Foundation in Alaska, the Ho-Chunk Nation, NIDA, and then First Nations. So you see like, um, for example, like farming, you know, how that was sort of revitalized uh, at Ho-Chunk, and how they navigated those systems. So the tribe gave this program 40 acres, and then they were able to build all these different, you know, um, you know, uh, a whole organic farm. So some of those vegetables and stuff, they got them. They have two convenience stores, they're gas stations. So that gas station sells those vegetables. Now, when they wrote, they, in, now, in their language and then in English. And then with that, they also created like a farmer's market. So all the kids go there and they sell. And then for us, it's just like two beds. You know, Chinoas is, we're, we're doing that, but not at that level, I guess. You know, for, we don't have 40 acres. Chinoa has like two little planting beds in our office, but they're still engaging, you know what I mean? But it's, so every tribe has their own, um, 
Yeah. Every tribe sort of has their own strength. <laughs> and that's what I liked about that collaboration and networking. I got a lot of good ideas. And then what we were doing, they really liked it too. So it was very different. Uh, anybody else? I have a question. Um, I work with freshman students, and they're semi-advisors. So I. The idea of using sweat lodge for the students to um, get to know each other and then build a supporting system, but it's just kind of you can only fit so many students in that circle. So we started doing research on talking circles to build a supportive system for students who are coming in who are from diverse cultures, their students who are homesick, their students who are maybe they lost a loved one, their students maybe it's the first time away from home. Um, so that's what we're doing, what I'm doing right now is um, doing research on talking circles. How, like, do you guys do talking circles? And then how often is a good consistency, like every week or like every month, or do you then implement that into your programs too? Yeah, talking circles or kind of like listening circles. Um, it's like a movement that started, you know, talking about like Pan Indian. And they even like integrate some people use like ceremony in it, like burn cedar, and you know, there's a like an Indian Native indigenous tool, you know, can be used. And uh, but what I see is like diversifying it is important. Especially if you're working in a short period of time. So you can integrate something like a talking circle in it and then something else. So next week, something like more of an empowerment group. Um, take them out on the nature hike, the next group. Because I think talking circles are part of like restorative justice or conflict resolution too. Like you bring people together to share. But you just do them every week, it's kind of like, you, you know, it, yeah. it's like, I don't have nothing else to share. You guys know me already, you know, told you everything you need to know about me. And I see that thing. Yeah. Unless somebody new comes in, and then it's like engaging. So I think that's what we do. We, we create like a menu, you know, like, remember those different five, um, I don't know, five different berries? So imagine sitting in a hogan for nine days and just eating mutton. Avery said he gets the third day. He said he starts to somebody makes a run to Burger King or something, bring in the variety. But yeah, so I just creating the variety I think is healthy, diversifying as well as like empowering. That's really really good. Anyone else? Uh, is this about preserving the neck culture, or is this more about uh, explaining the uh, Western system of care to people that are using them, like the elder, elder? It's it's actually both. It's cultural survival. Because <clears throat> like a system of care means like when you're hurting, right? No one goes to the center of the hogan. They got a huge request. This is really about that system of care that's there. And, and we know that you know, everyone goes to the hospital. So when you diversify and open up integrated care, you can use, you know, and still engage yourself into your ceremony or knowledge, skills, and abilities. And I think that's part of that cultural preservation. And part of the integrated care is this isn't the last, it's not the only place. And when you work in a system um, of care, it's like we're a hub to our hospital, our providers. So we provide these assessments, like maybe an example, like, oh, I need this ceremony, but I don't have a job. You know, I haven't got a blood work in 10 years and I have a toothache. So it's all right, let's have you see Avery. 
And then after that, we have these three needs. So then we'll see a case manager for job search. And then let's go take you to the dental program, get your teeth fixed, and then let's get your blood work done. So it optimizes the billing, or how we call it integrated care. So we're just a hub too, and we always we all work together. And this is an integrated care model is very different than any other hospitals uh, that I know. Everything's all separated, in sort of different silos. <coughs> so it is about preservation. It is about cultural, you know, um, like survival too. I think. Since you work with many people of ethnicity, is there any safeguards and cultural knowledge to that? Is there limitations to what you share? The limitations, I think they wouldn't understand it already. Um, I think that there's a When you see values, is there something here that you see that shouldn't be shared? No, I'm just saying in general since, I mean, there is a lot of them are not <laughs> of the network. And I guess when you live in the community, like um, my nephew, he's, he's not cut. Yeah. So how do I, you know, yeah. do I exclude him? In, or do I, today again, that is another challenge, right? Integration. So how do I, you know, we always see that, but um, a lot of times it's usually the foundation. No one's curious to say, and a lot of times too, the sweat lodge, when I was talking to Robin Renzo, Lakota, he says, these people come with strange ideas sometimes. I got a call like a couple weeks ago too, somebody said, hey, Lorenzo, we need, I have a, I'm from California, and you know I, I'm, I was a part of a circle, so I have this bear medicine. I just need some of you to validate it, or something like that. So bear medicine. So I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Like maybe you can find a connection somewhere. You know, talk to somebody, and here's where you can go, kind of like a place. So yeah, they come with different, you know, and I understand what you're saying as far as protection. So I think there's only a limit when we call it intervention. And usually this is the focus, um, our reinforcement. It's actually a curriculum right here. And we try not to make it too complicated. You know, let's share that. I hope that makes sense. But yeah, there's, we, we learn a lot when you're in an urban environment. And then um, we learn a lot, uh, even there are 19 pueblos that are there. I think we have over 400 different tribes in Albuquerque. So we're one of the tribes that is very implicit, right? we still have their language and all of that. So and I think um, I found this to be sort of that common sort of that common place. Um, and I, I, I wish I could share more because even as Navos, they make it complicated. Like, I don't know how many times I heard this for 10 years, they would say, Lorenzo, I'm an alcoholic, I'm homeless. All this because somebody jealous of me because I have a new truck. <laughs> so I had to deconstruct all that and get to this place. So even we make it really complicated. But it's a, again, a, a care package that we're sharing tonight. I hope this was um, useful to kind of, like I said, to look, at, look through it through a lens. <coughs> and, um, to be able to look at other possibilities when you know, we talk about the net values um, and how you could use this too as part of your um, 
to your professional work, uh, as well as you know, maybe even initiating, you know, um, using your education you know, towards um, other endeavors, other opportunities as well. Um, another question I had was uh, uh, with your, your clients that you guys have seen in, in treatment, uh, do you guys keep data on, on that? And is that public information or is that what do you guys do with that data? We, we kind of just are at what we call a satisfaction service. And we provide a lot of that so we collect a lot of data. And I can share that with you. But as far as any, because it gets really complicated um, to say, like, here's one example. Does Hachoja work? And there you go through the IRB, you got to go through all these institutional review boards. So if you're thinking of that kind of data, I guess that's where I kind of, there's a boundary, a limit. But like, I know people that, like Dr. Michelle Khan John, they, they did that research over at Salesforce Medical Center. I believe like 30 participants, they did a uh, saliva swab on sort of looking at different um, um, excitatory something, and, and as well as like, you know, what they reported, depression. And I, I can share that data with you. And that was very recent. And that was very specific. That was, they went through, she had to go through the Medicines Association, the Nehakati Association, as they have been not a lot, the Nation had to go through the IRD. And I, I thought that was useful, but again, um, you know, it's very complicated. As a matter of fact, we're meeting with the National Institute of Health with Dr. Khan John, Dr. David Gay, and others in Denver in November. So I think she's going to present on some of that information. I was just curious because I know like the VA they only use um, well they used to only use um, proven based therapies. Or, or sorry, to open up to uh, promise based therapies. Yeah, um, such so practices. Yeah, in the case of cut shed, and, um, I know the army is starting to uh, open up sweat lodges on different bases to treat PTSD. So they found uh, success with it in, in their own way too for their own research. That was interesting. Just how it's, it's kind of along the same lines of what you're doing. <clears throat> and, I, and I've learned that. I've learned how to navigate. Like I said, even working with different systems, like you can make it as complicated as you want. But my focus is providing that care, as well as you know, like for me, it's it's very working in the modern systems of care. Um, but. I can share some of that data with you guys if you guys are interested with Dr. Condit, Conjon. And I think it was Anderson Hosky was a practitioner who provided that. But man, it was just amazing like, data that was collected. This is called promising practice. And, um, and we're working on it. Um, just this model right here, um, the cultural values reinforcement approach, we're working on that with. Um, as a billable service. Yeah, I, uh, I would like to maybe share more and talk more with you some of your thoughts because I think um, you're the, you're the, um, you have the mind for it as well as I'm sure you've been, um, you know, all that knowledge that has been instilled in you so far in your studies. So maybe I'll get a chance one of these days to talk more or maybe like I said, come to First Nations, come to our clinic. Um, in Albuquerque, it's a little different because everything is, our community is really focused on collaborate, collaboration. <laughs> it's very different, unique. Anything else? Anybody? Yep. I've been working with First Nations for at least about how many years? About five years? And um, I will share this with my students that 
when you go to Albuquerque and when you go do treatment over there and do sessions over there, it's, it's like those natives, Navajos and other tribes, they have a need. And as soon as they see that layout, those are Ben Halahachish. When they see it right there, and they're heard, they might be walking like this, you know, coming into that room, but when they see that um, lay down or lay up, or they cut, then they, they change and they start walking like this. <laughs> that instant they change their behavior and then they, they sort of like go like this where I sit and then they behave. So that's how powerful it is. And uh, we've seen um, from the prison, local prison, they had all, all these um, chains on this um, prisoner Navajo. They, as soon as he went in there, he was calm. And he sat over there, he's supposed to be violent, you know. And he sat there with the treatment, and then um, after he left, that car came back, said, how do you guys do that, you know. So it's very effective and it's very instant. So, and then the only the thing that is different about treatment in the over there is um, when you tell a patient to be mindful for two days, not wash, take care. You know, you had you had a ceremony, but then send over it. You know, the kasikis and stuff like that. And then when you go back a month later, the patient will come back to you and say. Is it okay if I wash up now? <laughs> <laughs> so, what do you mean? You know, you you haven't washed up for a whole month, and then they say yes because I felt good. I didn't want to wash it off. Like, the feeling that I was that change and really kind of blessing. So is is it all right to wash now? And then when you see it in a hot lap, you know, uh, bless yourself, and then. They walk over there, or they on their knees. They go over there to that fire or whatever you have, and then they get close, you know, close to the to close to their faces, and they touch it like this, and they bless themselves, and they value and they cherish that you know, because they don't have it over there. There's nothing over there like that. And you drive all the way back to over here, like in Pinyon, or over here, and then you have a ceremony of God and all these Navajos that are sitting there and you say the same thing. Now go bless yourself. You know? On the inside of you. Let's just go like this. <laughs> over there, they walk over there and touch it like it's meaningful. And over here, when you say don't wash for four days, they say, can I wash on the second day? <laughs> See, there's a whole person because we don't appreciate these things and we don't value these things. We sort of like, we just put it in a different place. Even though you need it, you change and you, you don't appreciate it because it's, it's, you think it's here now. But all of a sudden, it's going to be all gone. Mm -hmm. And then it's going to be at Nam Ho it's going to be a behind the glass. And you'll try to um, press yourself behind the glass and go like this. And it's not really good no more. It's almost prayer, even the language. So, but as a provider, you psychologists, you speak. provider, psychiatrist, you'll need to be working with this integrative treatment. And this is going to be your model. And that's how you're going to approach. If you're going to be working on the Navajo Reservation, with other tribes, people, you will need to know about your Navajo traditional healing practices and be educated and be able to utilize it. So that's what is, is important to me because I'm working with that, this model with Lorenzo and all the other providers. And um, yeah, can you go to Albuquerque too? You go to eat chili. <laughs> I, I was just thinking uh, the question <coughs> protection because uh, patient confidentiality it's a law so when this is a therapeutic engagement so it's a care package it helps people and that's really 
If you're just in it to learn about the brain and the mind and study all that, neurotransmitters, that's one thing. But when you're talking about therapy and therapeutic, that's very different. And everybody's, and I don't ask, say, hey, tell me about how that x-ray machine works. You know, I don't, you know, that's something that's that, teach. and providers don't ever ask that too. Say, hey, how does that Avery bit work? I say, you don't need to know that. You have to be certified. I'm not just going to tell you, you know, we're not going to tell you. So, and then even patients and clients, like they're, they're protected by that level of confidentiality, you know, as a patient. So we, we actually, uh, it's a, again, part of integrated care. This is one model, and I guess there's so much more as we are evolving. It might be, this might be actually, um, like, if you notice that, we're, we're doing a lot more community engagement. We're doing a lot of, a lot of age appropriate. And I want to leave with this thought. I've been hearing this from my elders, like, our kids are losing their language. We're losing our ceremony. I, I hear that a lot. I heard that a lot. And one time I got the idea, I said, we collaborate and bring everybody together. So I went to the Nanette Conte Association back then, Dr. Anthony Lee and Dr. David Johns, and all these fellows, Herman Johnson, the late Herman Johnson, everybody together. And then I said, hey, let's bring all these kids together at Navajo Tech University in Tizan's bus. Let's bring them all together. And then we're going to have four different presentations you know, to share with them um, to the youth. And it was interesting because the youth that showed up were the Morning Star leaders from Phoenix. You know, Amber Cotty's kids, I think, are from Windrock, Gallup, they were from Aztec. So nobody in the community showed up. It was everybody drove from different places, and um, but there, um, I had the first presenter who was Ensign, and all these really good, really great. I could understand them. It was like opening up this visualization of this, like like opening up a book in my mind. Beautiful, man. Oh yeah, 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 talking. And they had these eight-year-olds and 15-year-olds down to like seven-year-olds in the audience. And they weren't even listening. They couldn't understand. They were getting bored. And I would say, after a story, can you please explain and interpret so they can understand? And then they would then just kind of continue on the way they're used to it. So even that scenario to bring people together Sounds like a good idea, but it's a lot more complicated. And I realize this culture, like there's teachings for children that's age appropriate. There's age appropriate culture for adolescents, for adults and elders. And I think that's where even there's culture that's appropriate for a patient to, to restore them back to health. So culture is very complicated, in other words. And I said, well, I learned that. So hopefully, maybe another gathering, you know, it'll be more of that sort of age appropriate level. Because what they were talking about was really beautiful. And like I said, I could understand it. But you know, a six-year-old, five-year-old, you know, child, you have to kind of bring it to that level too. So I'll leave on that thought. And um, again, I hope to continue a dialogue. And I uh, hope this was helpful. And uh, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not sure. I'll try to we'll do a ceremony tonight somewhere. <coughs> but uh, shoot game. There's no. <laughs> Well, let's give our guest speaker a round of applause.